Hey everybody, Jeff Schneider here. In today's video, I'm going to start a new series called Questions for Jeff. It's a Q&A style uh, episode show, whatever you want to call it. And I asked for some questions earlier today on my Instagram. Uh, by the way, that is right here. And I also asked for questions on my Facebook and my Patreon page. So I'm going to filter out uh, some of those and read them to you and then give you my answers. Here we go. Okay, so uh, the first question is going to come from one of my patrons. This is uh, Vince. He's a patron on my Patreon page. I'll link that up here if you care to, uh, to be a supporter. Feel free. Um, so his question is, how do you choose your chord voicings? Are there principles, rules? Well, there are some principles. There are some rules that I kind of abide by. But mostly, at this point, it's what sounds good. So I learned all the rules. I learned all the principles. And, and then I just kind of, now I just go by what I like in terms of what I hear and what I want it to sound like. Um, it's helpful to learn those rules because if you don't know them, then you're kind of just floundering and guessing. You can come up with good voicings that way too. It's just a little bit more efficient, I think, to learn some, some voicings, learn why and how voicings work well in different situations and kind of go from there. Um, but some of, the, uh, some of the ground rules, I would say, are uh, voice leading is really, really important. So you can have all the best voicings in the world, but if you're not voice leading from one chord to the next, then it's not such a great thing, is it? Uh, the other thing is the top note of your chord, this is kind of related to voicing, but the top note of your chord kind of acts like a melody where you're, whether you're thinking of it as a melody or not. So be aware of that, that top voice so that it's, it's not doing anything too awkward. But to tell you the truth, that goes for all of the different notes within your voicing. So this is kind of the number one rule. And it, it, again, it is related to voice leading. Make sure every single note in your chord acts as its own solid quality melody. So if you have um, inner voices, meaning the notes that are in between the two outer voices, obviously, uh, make sure that those inner voices are moving to uh, the, the subsequent inner voices in a way that is musical and melodic. So don't just focus on the melody, uh, although it's extremely important, but you also want to pay attention to the notes inside your chords and make sure they're moving from one chord to the next in a very melodic and musical way. Hope that makes sense. Uh, by the way, I'm going to be coming out with a, a course soon about voicings and about voice leading and about creating chord progressions. So stay tuned for that. It's going to be very comprehensive. Um, and I think that'll that'll at least help you with the, uh, the rules and the principles that I alluded to before, because there are many of them and they're helpful to know. But uh, let's uh, let's move on from there. I've got uh, I'll do one more question from Vince. He listed a bunch, but hey, he's a patron. So, you know, what is the best Rhodes emulator on Earth? I don't know. I've, I've never tried them all. I'm currently using Keyscape uh, by Spectrosonics. I love that company. They do Omnisphere. They do Trillion. They do Keyscape. And it's a really, really great uh, selection of electronic pianos from um, from your Rhodes to uh, all kinds of stuff. I mean, it's really, really cool. So um, check them out. Great product. Uh, I've also tried um, Scarby, I think it's called. That's in the Native Instruments bundle. Uh, and that's a that's a great Rhodes too. But I think at the end of the day, what really makes a Rhodes sound good is how you play it. So keep that in mind. Performance is always going to trump uh, gear, no matter what. Okay, I'm going to move on to my Instagram comments now. All right, I got a question here from Armin John Cena. Where did you get your dog? LOL. Um, my wife and I got our dog from Indiana. There you go. No, our dog is the best. Her name's Maybelline. We've had her for about a year and a half. I've made some videos about her. I'll link one of them here or here. I can never remember which side that's on. But anyway, yeah, that's uh, that's Maybell, Maybelline, May. A lot of different nicknames. Maybelline the Queen. She's great. She's a pug. Okay. Uh, next, we got G Merrick twenty two. What is the best thing about being a professional musician? I think the uh, sort of the cliche answer to that question is, well, you get to do what you love, and that's true. You get to do what you love, and that's a great thing. Um, when you're a professional musician, I think that assumes that you make money doing music, which is what I am fortunate fortunate enough uh, to be able to say that I do. The other great thing about being a professional musician is just like any um, business owner, you're you're the boss, you're in charge. You don't have to play by anybody else's rules. You call the shots. Um, so I basically do uh, what I want to do when I want to do it. And that is uh, an, an amazing thing. And I, I love that about not only being a musician, but just being my own boss. Okay, I've got a question here from Infinity1996. How do you progress from a prescriptive um, classical player to a more improvisational one? Uh, you know, I was never much of a classical player, so that's not the uh, 
So it's a little bit of a tough question for me to answer, but classical music does definitely have opportunity for improvisation, both in the literal sense and just in the sort of the musical sense. And what I mean by that is there's plenty of classical music out there now that incorporates improvisation. So there's that. But also, even if you're not improvising in the traditional way where you're making up uh, mu music pitches and rhythms on the spot, you can also improvise in the way that you perform, which is really interesting. Like there's so much more to music than just the notes and the rhythms, but how you play those notes and rhythms really is what's exciting about music, I think. And, and that's where you can start incorporating a little bit more of an impro improvisational approach to the way you play, not just what you play. Um, having said that, as I said, there are uh, plenty of opportunities to improvise within classical music. And then, of course, if you want to venture into jazz, that's always uh, a great option because, you know, as uh, I'm sure many of you know, jazz is, is such an improvised music that uh, it really lends itself well to, uh, to exploring that side of things. Okay, uh, next question is from Not Quite Justin. What are some musicians that really impacted how you approach uh, and sound on keys? By the way, love your stuff, man. Your take on instructional videos is super refreshing. Well, thank you for the kind words, not quite Justin. As for your question, um, I would say, you know, I don't really have specific pianists that have impacted the way that I play the keys. Uh, it's more just artists and bands and styles of music kind of all coming together. And then me just kind of messing around for years and years and years and eventually coming up with uh, a sound and, and music that I like. So, you know, I've, I've been listening to everybody from, uh, you know, D'Angelo, who I'm obsessed with, to George Duke, to Michael McDonald, to, um, you know, Herbie Hancock, Chick Corea, um, Chopin. I mean, it's like such a range. Um, but even even in, in that group of musicians that I just mentioned, there's a real rich harmony uh, that a harmonic palette that they have access to that I try to achieve as well. So I love harmony and I love uh, exploring different ways of moving chords from one uh, one chord to the next and, and coming up with different voicings and progressions. And, you know, God knows I've stolen so many progressions out there. And then, as I said, combine what I've learned into my own stuff. And that's, I think, how you get good at music is you listen to a bunch of different people. You kind of take what you like, you mash it and mush it up all together. And then you have you, you have you. Um, and that takes time to kind of come out the other end of that tunnel where you where you're playing you and not somebody else. But uh, I think it's a worthwhile endeavor. OK, we're back um, this time with a baby. Trying to keep this guy calm while I do some more questions. And our next question is from Anthony Tam 24. So uh, what is your best way to prepare for an audition? Also, um, best approach to an audition mindset. So preparing for an audition is, um, it's, it's similar to preparing for a performance. And that is, you need to be able to play whatever it is you're working on uh, consistently, perfectly, again and again and again, without any mistakes. Uh, certainly for an audition where you're playing a prepared piece, um, like a piece of classical music or something like that, where it needs to be exact. Um, you, you need to be able to do it that way more than once in a row without making any errors. And if you can do that, then you're going to have a good chance of doing a good job in the, uh, the audition. So I always say, you know, make sure you're able to play your piece five times in a row without making any mistakes. Uh, that's a difficult thing to do, especially if it's a difficult piece. But um, that way, you, you at least have a good shot of playing it right in the audition. What a lot of people end up doing is they, they'll practice and... Um, you know, they'll play it wrong a bunch or they'll work even if it's just a passage or a whole piece, they'll play it again and again. They'll make a couple of mistakes. They'll fix them, make a couple of mistakes, and fix, fix them. But they end up playing it wrong more than they're playing it right. So, well, when it comes time to the audition and performance, what do you think is going to happen? You're going to most likely play it the way you've played it more often or more frequently, which is wrong. So practice it right more often than you practice it wrong. I think that's sort of a, a good rule to uh, to abide by. Also, when you go to an audition or a performance, you have all these things like nerves and an audience to deal with, and that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother thing. That, um, the way to get better at that is experience and doing a lot of those types of things. So, um, you know, if it's uh, your first performance or your first audition, you're probably going to be more nervous in that situation compared to your 100th audition or performance. So uh, get experience. That'll help with the nerves, but also being prepared 
will uh, will certainly be the biggest help of all. So practice perfectly and you'll perform perfectly, hopefully. Okay, uh, just joshing Arnd. A-R-N-D asks, did you go to a music school or did you learn all of this from scratch? Um, I learned both in music school and from scratch, I guess. Uh, I, I taught a lot of the stuff myself to myself. I learned a lot of the stuff from friends and peers and uh, teachers. So I, um, I went to a New England Conservatory of Music for my undergrad and UMass Amherst for my uh, grad, grad school. And both experiences were, uh, were, were fantastic. And I learned a ton, and not just from the teachers, but as I said, from my my peers as well. Learned a ton from my uh, from my friends there. And I've also figured out a lot of stuff on my own, just in the practice room, and and writing, and improvising, and and teaching others was is a super uh, important part of me learning how to how to play and get better. Because when you teach somebody, you um, you not only help them learn, but you, you also teach yourself because you think of things in, in different ways when you're working on them with other people. Uh, we got a question here from JTS Sachs. Have you ever played as a street performer or musician? What do you think about street performers and musicians? Um, I've never really done the busking thing. I think I've sat in with a couple of bands. One was in the subway in New York once, just on a random, uh, I was on my way to a gig and I thought, hey, why not? And then um, the other time, I think it was out when I was like in high school and I was just with my friend Tom and we set up outside of the library and just played saxophone for a half an hour. So I haven't really done too much of the street performing thing, but I think it can be, it's a really cool way to get some experience playing in front of people and, and sharing what you've been working on. And if you make a little bit of money, you know, all the better, but it certainly is a good opportunity to practice performing, which is kind of tied back to that question about auditions where, you know, how do you get experience? Uh, playing in front of people, well, you can set up on a corner and, and do it that way. One way to do it. Or, you know, in the digital age, maybe you put up a YouTube video and you you, you play that or set up a, a live stream on your Instagram channel or something and, and play there. So there's lots of different ways of playing in front of people if that's something that you're looking to gain experience on. Okay, Andy Lopez asks, how long have you been playing saxophone and were you in middle or high school band with saxophone? Okay, so let's see. I am 30 years old. And I started playing, I think, in seventh grade. So I was probably uh, around 11 then, 10 or 11, I think. Uh, most, of, most of my friends, or most people, I think, and at least in where I grew up, start in fourth grade. So I started a little bit later. Um, you know, I was playing piano before then and, and guitar. And then uh, I wanted to try a band instrument. So actually, you know what? I started violin in third grade and lasted about six weeks before I had had enough. And I was in middle school band. I was in high school band. And I uh, had some really great teachers in middle and high school. So that was awesome. You're hungry. Okay. We're going to go feed you. All righty. We're feeding the baby and moving on to the next question. Uh, I'm assuming you went to music school and I'm wondering where you found motivation to get through grade school because I'm genuinely having issues with it. Uh, this is from Normal Life. I think the, the name of the user is here. It's a great question. I mean, I can certainly relate. When I was in high school, that's when I really started practicing a ton um, and becoming just completely obsessed with music, like where I didn't really care that much about my other classes. Um, so I can relate here. Uh, I kind of decided at that point, oh, I'm going to be a musician. There's no doubt about it. I'm going to go to music school. My grades don't matter. And to a certain extent, that was true, and it's and it's worked out okay. But at the same time, I kind of regret not giving more attention to my other classes just because you don't really get that opportunity later on in life to be in a situation where you're, you're in a class being forced to do. I mean, it doesn't sound like that appealing, um, and I'm sure it's, it doesn't feel that way when you're in the moment in that class. But, you know, there's something to be said for, like, being challenged – in uh, in a way that you you aren't normally like um, in a math class or in an English class or a history class where you're being you're being asked to think critically about something that um, you wouldn't otherwise. And I always thought to myself, you know, this is this is stupid. I'm never going to have to use the stuff that they're teaching me in these classes. And you know, to a certain extent, that's true. Like, there's a lot of really advanced math that um, that is taught, especially in high school, that you don't. You don't need in, in, in real life, but uh, unless your your field is uh, is is math based, I suppose. Um, 
but that's not the point. The point is that you're kind of you're exercising your brain so that you can do other things that you you don't even know that you'll you'll want to do later on. Um, it's kind of like when you work out at the gym. Let's say you play basketball or something, and you work out at the gym. Now, when you're working out at the gym, you're you're not working with a basketball necessarily, but you're you're working on muscles that are going to apply to the game. You, you know what I mean? It's it's about exercising your brain and and being able to think critically and and work hard at something and be challenged. Like those are skills that are certainly going to be useful if you want to be um, a musician, even though you're not necessarily working on your your music theory or your uh, your technique. Uh, there's there's something about being a human that is uh, is obviously uh, important for, for being a musician and, um, you're going to get those skills in classes that are not just about music. Okay. C. Jancola asks, is it possible to have an ear so trained that you don't have to learn and understand chord progressions or is knowledge of chords uh, a necessity? That's a great question. Uh, something that I used to think about, especially in, um, in my later years in high school and early years in, in college where I was, just so tired of learning theory and I just wanted to play by ear. So I would turn the sheet music over. I would turn the changes over and I would just try to hear my way through the charts. So I would be more uh, in the music and, and less, you know, staring at chords and thinking about things and, and just focus on playing. And, and that, I think that, that helped. That was actually like a really good practice for me. Um, you know, of course there are, there are tunes that have really complex harmony and it can certainly help to have that map in front of you with the chord changes on it. Um, but your question is, is it possible to do away with all of that and just play by ear essentially? And I think it is possible. You know, um, I'm not positive about this, but uh, guys like Stan Getz and Chet Baker, you know, I don't think they really knew too much about theory um, and, and they just played primarily by ear. I might be wrong about that, but I'm, I'm pretty sure I heard that uh, those two guys especially were, were very much ear players and they they were just able to, to play and they didn't worry about chord chords or anything like that or rather the names of chords obviously they're still playing chords they just didn't necessarily know their names that being said knowing the names of chords and being familiar with theory doesn't mean you have to turn your ears off that's sort of what I realized a little bit later on where I had um, gotten a, a good hold of all the theory uh, I got my ear in a place where I could I could play what I heard and then uh, the two kind of work together where you have sort of this um, this partnership between your right brain and your left brain, your left brain being the more theoretical, analytical side, and then your right brain being more abstract and, and hearing things. So the two support each other. Uh, at the end of the day, your your right brain is kind of the boss. You know, you have to be playing what you hear, but the the left brain, the theory side, will help you figure out what the notes are to what it is that you're hearing. Um, I hope that makes sense. Okay, we got B. We got a question here from BEH1485. I think this guy's name is Bradley in real life. Um, he asks, who does your hair? I need to know what products you use. Exclamation point. Hashtag questions for Jeff. Hashtag hair goals. Uh, well, Bradley, um, if you remember several, several videos back, uh, this company called Hans DeFuco sent me some hair products. And uh, I haven't run out yet, and I'm still using them, still using them and they're great. I think I have a, uh, a promo code for them uh, somewhere. I'll see if I can find it. But uh, good luck with your hair. It's, it's a really important part about being a musician. Got to gotta look good. Okay, the Tanner Scott asks, sometimes I see your master bus is clipping. Is it okay to export it like that? Um, I, I don't think my master bus ever clips. Uh, you know, it gets to zero dB, but never above that because I put a limiter at the end of my, my two bus. So uh, it doesn't. So it doesn't go over that that level. Um, that being said, I think what you want to focus most on is that RMS level, which is sort of the average level uh, of your music. And these days, that's around like nine dB. What you really should do is, is load in some reference tracks uh, for similar types of music, similar styles of music. See what the levels are on those reference tracks, and then match yours accordingly. <laughs> Okay. Uh, oh, by the way, the limiter that I am using these days is uh, is the FGX. I think it's called. It's by Slate Digital, 
and you can get that as part of the uh, the everything bundle and that's linked in my gear list in the description below so quick update uh, just got the baby to fall asleep uh, definitely have a little bit of spit up on my shoulder here but i uh, hope you guys don't mind we're going to keep going with a couple more questions and then uh, got to go to bed it's getting a little bit late so here we go next question Gabe Flo asks, Hey Jeff, have you ever encountered problems with overthinking things when it comes to music, whether it's how to practice or how to improvise? If so, how do you strive to overcome this? What steps have you taken? Uh, Gabe, this is a great question, something that I definitely do, which is overthinking just about everything really. Um, but especially in music, it's, uh, it's a dangerous place to be thinking too much um, because you want to be you want to be playing, you're not thinking. So what I mean by that is, uh, especially with, with theory and things like that, where you're thinking about chord changes and thinking about uh, the proper way to develop a solo or, or um, interact with the rhythm section, there's all of these things you can be thinking about while playing, especially when it comes to improvising. Um, but if you think about things too much, then you, you're not in the zone, you're not in a flow state, and you're not going to be playing your best because you're focusing on things that aren't that important in the moment. I mean, they're important, but you don't want to be focusing on them in, in the moment. You want to be focusing on the music. And I think that's the answer in a way right there. It's, it's focus on the music. Uh, your job is not to, it's not to be good. It's to make the music good. One other thing that's important is there's so much information out there nowadays, especially when it comes to practicing, like knowing how to practice or what to practice is really challenging now because there's, there's so much, you know, before the internet, there was much less information, um, or at least much less access to the information. So, you know, maybe you had a few records that you listened to or a teacher or some friends that played music and you kind of learned from them, but you certainly didn't have Spotify and, um, YouTube and, and all those things where you have tons and tons of music and information to listen to. And that all can be really inspiring and useful but it can be detrimental if you're too scattered when it comes to practicing. So my advice there is to pick what you like, find something you really like, whether it's a style of music or a style of playing or a lick even, find something that you like and, and master it and, and be able to explore it uh, for, for a long period of time. And that means more than, a, more than a day, more than a week, more than a month. Maybe you focus on one thing for a few months at a time and then you can move on to something else. But it's it's dangerous to be very very scattered in your in your practicing because then you're not going to get anything done. So focus on what you like, focus on the music that you enjoy, the sounds that you you are inspired by, and explore them and and uh, try to zero in on something for an extended period of time before moving on to anything else. Uh, you don't want to be a, a jack of all trades, master of none. Okay, we got so many great questions. I'm not going to be able to get to all of them, unfortunately, but I'm going to do more of these Q&As in the future. So, so I'll let you know when I do my next q and I'll, I'll post something on uh, Instagram and Facebook and Twitter that there's a Q&A coming up so you guys can leave your questions there. So uh, my, my Instagram is uh, here and my Facebook is here and my Twitter is here. Can you see that? Uh, okay, so here's uh, here's an interesting question from Miriam P. Durand on Instagram. What are the differences between R&B and Neo Soul? Thanks for your videos. This is a great question. Um, so R&B, in case you don't know, many of you do, but it stands for Rhythm and Blues. Uh, and Neo Soul is a subgenre of Rhythm and Blues. Rhythm and Blues came about in the 1940s. It, it came out of jazz. Um, and it was just before rock and roll hit. So uh, Neo Soul didn't really come into the mainstream until the late 90s with um, with people like D'Angelo and Lauryn Hill and Erica Badu. So R&B is a huge genre of music that has many subgenres, including neo-soul and soul music and disco and funk, uh, contemporary R&B. They're all coming out of R&B. Now, in, in terms of the, the music side of things, uh, Neo Soul was kind of a, as I said, it was coming around in the, the late 90s and um, mid to late 90s. And it was kind of a reaction to the mainstream R&B of the day, which was a little bit more digital, uh, more produced. And if you listen to the Neo Soul records, it's more organic. Um, it's sort of a, a reaction against that more digital produced sound. So, you know, it take a record like... Um, 
uh, take any of those D'Angelo records with Quest Love playing drums, you know, Quest Love talks about playing drums in sort of a very drunk style. Uh, you know, if you listen to those beats, it's got that very laid back, sloppy groove to it. It, it grooves super hard, but it's it's anything but to a click track or to a drum machine. So it's um, it provides contrast from the R and B of the uh, the contemporary R and B of the the day. The neo soul stuff was a bit more. Uh, I think it leaned a little bit more towards jazz. Um, certainly more organic with real instruments. Um, echoing soul music from the seventies, like Stevie Wonder, Donny Hathaway, Marvin Gaye. Uh, so when you listen to neo soul. Listen also to music of the 70s, like Stevie Wonder and Marvin Gaye and Donny Hathaway, and see if you can put those connections together. And also listen to other R&B music of that, of that time, where you can really um, you can see the contrast or hear the contrast between the two styles of music. So I'm I'm not a I'm not a music historian by any means, but I hope uh, you know that little bit of information provides some context around the differences between neo soul and R&B. I'm going to call it a night. It's kind of late here and I'm starting to slow down as you can see. But um, for the next one, for the next Q&A, feel free to leave your comments below with questions. I'll, I'll reference this video for, for the next Q&A and I'll also post on my channels, social channels about when the next uh, edition is coming out and we'll do uh, more questions there. So thanks for watching. I hope you guys enjoyed this. Hope it was valuable. And thanks for all the great questions. Sorry I didn't get to all of them, but uh, there's always next time. By the way, I do hit up the patron Patreon questions first. So if you do want to support me on Patreon, I'll link that up top and down below and uh, feel free to leave your questions there too. Alrighty. Thank you all for watching and I'll see you in the next video.